Can you see my uh, screen? Yeah. Wait, Adhar, we have to wait. We'll, I'll introduce you first and then we can start. Yeah, of course. <clears throat> Good morning, dear friends. Uh, welcome to AIG, yet again uh, another program with uh, eminent international speaker. Uh, and uh, this time we have uh, a very prominent guest. Uh, he is Dr. Arthur Cafis. He is from Sydney, Australia. He is uh, associate professor in Sydney University and affiliate affiliated to uh, Royal Prince Alfred Hospital. He is a very inno innovative gastroenterologist and involved in many innovation, especially he has uh, many innovation against his name, uh, some of them like uh, uh, metal stands and he is also working on the prototypes of cholangioscopy. So he is very innovative person and uh, we are lucky to have him today with us and uh, we will be uh, going to him directly to Sydney where we will listen to him about uh, how the Australians uh, have uh, you know tackled this COVID and how the gastroenterologist is now practicing there. So Arthur welcome to uh, India and uh, you are very known here and uh, we will be delighted to listen to you. Oh, well, that's a very, very uh, generous uh, introduction. Thank you so much. And um, as we were saying just before this, uh, really the, the story in Australia has been very positive. So I, I really will, would go on to reflect um, just how things have been quite good in Australia and, and um, why they're, they're quite good. Just briefly, the, the presentation today is as follows. I mean, I, clearly at the beginning, I want to set out that this is... Um, has been and continues to be a global disaster. And unfortunately, it's, it's continuing to accelerate. And far too many of people have been infected, not just those who have died from the virus, but friends, relatives, uh, economic outfalls. So it's been a real tragedy and it's, it's, it's yet to, to um, uh, end its reign. Um, I think probably the most defining element in the management of COVID has been in preempting and acting uh, early, uh, and I'll go on to talk about this a few times. Uh, I'll go through a timeline of how I was affected through the process and how that paralleled uh, the Australian government's reaction and how that contrast it was different to many other parts of the world. I've thrown in a little bit of humour because that's something that's been really important for all of us to, to get through some of these difficult times. So um, I'll move into the presentation. So just a little bit about my role in COVID in Australia. So I practice in two university teaching hospitals, uh, Royal Prince Alfred and Prince of Wales. I also have work in three private hospitals which are attached to these government hospitals. I'm director of endoscopy at the, uh, at the Royal Prince Alfred, and I'm also chairman of endoscopy in the National Society uh, of Australia. And so for me, I was in a position to look at what was happening in the private sector, the government sector in large teaching hospitals, as well as on a national scale, so throughout the different states of the country. And often people would ring me and ask me advice or, or voice their concerns. And so the, the thing that was overwhelming for me is that I, I sort of understood the different layers that were occurring. And I, and I felt that I had to really lead by example. You know, as the chair of endoscopy, I had to to make statements and guide the rest of the community to avoid suffering and really to try and, and, and make sure our situation in Australia was good. So this is the first little funny caption, um, which is that all of us at school, when we did mathematics, learned about exponential curves, but some kids in the back of the class thought that, that this was a waste of time and was not important. But yeah, this is really what defined people's reactions and understanding of what happens. And so I'll just digress and say that fundamentally, if you're sitting on a thousand cases today and you know that the doubling rate, which is often around five days, uh, and by the time you, your virus spreads with a, a government reaction to that virus, it's probably 15 days before you'll see any benefit, that at the 15 day mark, you'll now have 8,000 cases. If you then decide to act 
another 15 days later, you'll have 64,000 cases. So understanding this fundamental element that if you act at 1,000 at that point, you'll deal with eight. But if you wait for the eight, you'll have to deal with 64,000. And this is essentially a fundamental understanding that you can't wait to see what happens. You've got to act before it happens. And so this is my timeline, and I'll just draw your attention to the first uh, documented case early December in China, Wuhan. And then at the end of December, the WHO releases an alert. I, of course, during that time of the year, it's a holiday period in Australia, and I had my family on holidays. And when the holidays were finished, I actually was spent a few days in AIG with you, Mohan, if you remember. Yes. Um, and we did some prototype testing. Um, and it wasn't till about a week later when I was back in Australia that we had a public emergency listing by the WHO. So when I, I started to hear about it, and we all started to be aware of this problem occurring globally, I guess this to me was really the time to act. And I knew what was coming up in my calendar. I had the Thai Society meeting to do some live cases and a lecture followed by the WEO, which I was uh, to go and do live cases through the AIG. And I knew that really I had to make a decision at this point before the Thai meeting, because if I waited and I went and did the live cases and I came through the WO and then see what happens, what happens then is you have a pandemic, which was um, announced around the 11th to 13th of March. So really, I think following my understanding of logarithmic curves, this was the time to act, not here. And I think that was really fundamental. And, and to show you how difficult it was to make such a decision, again, this is the point where I think a decision needs to be made. You can see what was happening in Australia, nothing. We had virtually no cases. So there were a lot of people who were saying, this will be fine, it's not an issue, we don't have a problem yet, so why act now? And I thought if I was responsible and I needed to act now and preempt rather than wait to act at a critical point when things were gonna get out of control. And I think the Australian government was, was really felt the same way. The thing that made my decision easy also to cancel was that Thailand then became uh, just before the, the Thai meeting became a, a high-risk status by the WHO, and so we opted to pull out very early. And so we decided to act here uh, in an early situation. Again, some timeline <coughs> issues here where really a lot of the action started to become evident in March. What was interesting in all of this is I decided to pull out of the meetings and quarantine stay at home and start um, learning a little bit about what, what this all meant. Because for me, this was new. I was a gastroenterologist. I, I do ERCP and EUS and colonoscopy. I didn't know what PPE was. And I remember we had a meeting just before I canceled my trip to Thailand where someone mentioned PPE and I had no idea what they meant. Um, and then people were talking about N95 grade PPE. And I thought, well, what is that? And then people were using the expressions doffing and donning our um, PPE and, and it was all just new to me and, and flattening the curve was probably the first thing that I was exposed to. And so of course you all understand what flattening the curve is, is that to control the numbers so you don't get this mad rush, this tsunami of patients which outstrips your ability to, to look after them. And then we were being posted all around the hospitals and in emails, you know, how to wash your hands, how to put on your personal protection equipment how to take it off and, and there were lessons learnt from SARS about how we should take it off. So for all of us, we, we were getting all this information which we weren't really familiar with. So the first step became quite evident what as a society is, uh, we needed to do. And here's a picture of me uh, coming in wearing my N95 mask, on top of that my surgical mask with my facial uh, screening and following all the guidelines. So uh, we all started to learn about this stuff. Uh, of course, the paranoid ele element in me went uh, shopping on the internet to look at what what was even better than what the hospital had to offer because a lot of discussion was about we don't have an available supply of PPE. And so I started looking at what, what was available for me to buy and have with me. So 
it was really clear that, that there was a lot to learn and our society needed to act very quickly to try and get information out to our users about how to protect themselves and how to keep themselves safe in the event they needed to do procedures on these patients. And it was to my surprise that there was a lot of resistance, even at our board level, to, to get this document out. And I, and I thought it was really imperative and I, I pushed very, very hard to make sure this came through. And in, um, um, after about one or two weeks of arguing, we released a document on March the 20th to um, you know, guide our, our members and guide our community on, on protecting themselves. Um, and this is the document essentially, considerations regarding endoscopy and COVID units with a lot of uh, links to information about how to protect yourself. And this is where our government played a key role. We had the full support of our government. They paralleled my concerns and, and many of my colleagues' concerns. They considered this a war that we needed to fight early. They put a complete stop to all non-emergency surgery and procedures, not only to minimise contact, but to also conserve our, our protection equipment. Uh, travel bans came into place. So the government in Australia really acted very early. And it was quite frightening in that time, you know, we are trying to learn how to protect ourselves, we are trying to learn about all this different equipment. Um, and then we had these reports coming out of Europe, which were really frightening, particularly from Italy and Spain, where all these doctors had died because of the lack of PPE or the, the knowledge how to use it, entire hospitals being converted to COVID hospitals. And it was quite frightening uh, what was coming from overseas. So there was a lot of uncertainty. There was a lot of panic in the community. You know, the shelves were empty. And I'm not sure if all of you read the reports in Australia that the hottest item during the COVID crisis was toilet paper. And all these funny little captions were coming out about um, toilet paper being the most uh, valuable commodity in Australia. Um, you know, major cancellations were occurring. So this was getting very serious. You know, the Olympics had to be postponed and we all went into lockdown. And I particularly like this picture of Perth before and after lockdown and it doesn't look very different, but um, um, that's Perth for you. And everybody was locked down. And the next thing you saw was an unusual phase where everyone was started to post what they were doing at home. You know, the butt coin became the most valuable item and here's my colleague, pile, getting up at 6 a.m. to queue up to get some toilet paper. And people were posting all their, their cooking and their drinking at home. And, and it was um, an interesting time spending so much time quarantined at home and uh, essentially just um, not doing anything. A little bit of telehealth only and, and a lot of cooking and drinking as Australians do. Uh, and someone posted this funny little uh, puzzle just to pass your time. And if you can read it, it says nowhere, nowhere, nowhere. So it was all a bit depressing, but uh, all in good humour made us get through these difficult days. Uh, again, some jokes about how much Australians like to drink, particularly wine, um, which we found quite amusing, and the frustrations of staying at home um, for so long. So it was a very surreal time that we were just locked at home and not, not doing anything. And... As every day went by, there were new releases and new comments. Um, not only was there a cancellation of non-urgent surgery, there was suddenly categories of surgery. And, and this was released the day after we released our PPE guidelines. And I had never, ever considered endoscopy and procedures according to this sort of surgical category. And so this was completely new for us. And of course, our members then started calling and saying, well, what's a category one procedure, Arthur? What, what should we be doing? What shouldn't we be doing? And so we were then in this mad rush to try and get a document out to guide our members and our, our gastro community as to what procedures they can and can't do, which we did only a few days later when, when the board realised the importance and how things were accelerating. And we started to actually quantify what is a category one a category two and category three document and soon after the British Society released their their suggestions as well which were very similar to, to what we had released so even though we we're at home and we were eating too much and drinking too much and staying safe we were also quite active um, really helping guide the community uh, in, in Australia reports were coming out again further from uh, Europe and also in China about 
the risks, uh, the mortality risk and the, the comorbidities uh, increasing your, your mortality risk. And, and it was very frightening at that time. And we got important information such as that the rates of positivity of COVID, even in the faeces was quite high. And so that we had this battle of, of uh, convincing people that PPE was required even for colonoscopy based procedures. And, and then people started to see this as a real problem. And you can see the curve here in the early days of Australia started to really kick up around that time we released our documents. So it all became very, very serious. It became so serious that I opted to buy the more expensive mask, which is this one on the right. And I still have it in my car for future events because, you know, the future is really uncertain and whether we have more pandemics or, or COVID lingering for one or two or three years and, and we get called in to do complex procedures for these patients, we need to have the best possible protection. So I went and bought this one. And the really disappointing thing for me, having pushed very hard to get our documents and our guidelines and our practice uh, advice out to the community and the government pushing very hard was overseas really, the disappointing um, reaction by a lot of our, our global leaders um, being very, as I say, nonchalant and very, um, uh, delayed in their reactions, which, as you know now, has paid uh, an ultimate price in their country. Um, we we're getting bizarre comments and recommendations like we did from the US about using UV light and disinfectants and people publishing funny uh, New England Journal papers of saying that this will kill you, don't do it. So uh, it was a very, very unusual and disappointing time um, globally. Um, one of my favourite pictures that was posted by a friend of mine was that the, the sales of Corona beer suffered dramatically when the coronavirus came out simply because it shared the same name. And it was just funny how people react uh, in these difficult times uh, without thinking. And, of course, a few more funny uh, little uh, uh, um, pictures were sent around, particularly about the US president and misunderstanding the role of a mask. But one of the key things that our government also did was shut down face-to-face -face consultations. They really wanted patients to be managed as outpatients, but from telehealth. So we often set up at home little makeshift offices, computers and software packages with Zoom meetings. And now, even to this day, most of us now don't have face-to-face -face consultation. It's really all about um, um, having this distance, uh, social distancing. And we're reimbursed for this telehealth and patients like it. They feel safe. Um, and it really made it very easy for us to then allocate the Category 1, Category 2 cases that needed urgent procedures. And all of this early action, all of this intervention on every level through Australia started to see in very early um, um, peaks a turn in the curve, which was really got us all very excited. We did have a couple of setbacks. Uh, I'm not sure if you heard in the news that we had two cruise ships of very many patients highly infected uh, disembarking and walking around Sydney and, and they actually became responsible for one third of cases in all of Australia and, and hence one third of deaths. Um, and here's a little caption of a castaway avoiding the ship because it was so dangerous. And the other concern that we had was that if you look at the green bar, we, we had people coming from overseas who were infected and we had their close contacts who were infected, but there was this unknown community spread and people were concerned about a second phase because we had this unknown element in the community. But it was pretty quick, pretty quick before we realized that this was not gonna be the case. And this is an important graph because it just shows you how aggressive our government was and to shut down the borders. Initially China, followed by Iran and South Korea, and then Italy, closing down public gatherings, internal gatherings, outdoor gatherings, uh, quarantining people, social distancing, and so forth. So our government was really aggressive, as many of us were very aggressive in shutting this thing down. Um, here's a picture of uh, some recent numbers that were posted on the internet by our government showing we only had four cases of coronavirus, all in quarantine travelers. No community transmission now for 11 days. No new cases uh, posted just the other day. 
and you can see in the entire state of New South Wales, we only have 11 patients admitted to the hospital and only two in intensive care. So really, when we look at these numbers, we are essentially now unaffected by COVID. Virtually no issues at all. And, and here's the, um, the WHO worldometer, which you can monitor the, the cases and the increase. And this was taken a few days ago where US really leads the way. And again, the, the thing that you notice in places like US, Brazil and Russia, even the UK, they had this lack of urgent response. They had this herd immunity, let's wait and see what happens. And the only thing that really happened was that they, they hit the top of this table uh, at the cost of many lives. And I'm very concerned for my friends, you guys in, in India with some staggering numbers and, and increasing. And just to show you an example here, Sweden had a herd immunity um, attitude to let the virus pass through. And you can see their numbers and how they compare to Australia, who are, and Australia has double the population of Sweden. Another country that performed similarly to Australia with a very aggressive shutdown of its borders and quarantining was Greece and was a shining light in the European sector and is the same size as Sweden. You, you can see the difference between 3,000 patients infected versus 42,000. So having an aggressive approach early, being decisive early, not waiting to see what happened uh, is what was required and unfortunately not delivered in many places. And as far as early as 27th of April, we had relaxing of, of um, uh, elective surgery with procedures being advised to restart. And our hospital and government's been very active to pay for a lot of patients to come in and clear out those who have been waiting uh, to deliver healthcare so that we don't see this uh, delayed delivery of healthcare causing, a, uh, if you like, an innocent bystander effect. So what does the, the future hold for us? Well, look, you know, there is a possibility of a second wave as the borders and the quarantines relax. What does it mean for future travel? I think there's going to be a big problem globally. It may not be such an issue locally. Whether a vaccine is released, I'm, I'm very doubtful of that, but let's hope one does come. I'm sure we'll be exposed to future pandemics and now we're better equipped to really deal with that. And really for us as uh, endoscopists and educators, we have a real significant impact on our ability to have live workshops. And really the future is gonna be moving to webinars. And you can see just like this, that educational events, including live endoscopy can be um, really uh, uh, dealt with in a very positive way in this fashion. So the future will be, I think, very, very different, um, but you know, time will, will show uh, how we can adapt to that. Thank you very much for your attention and, and good luck to you all over there. Thank you, uh, Arthur, for your thoughts and uh, giving you the uh, very detailed picture. I'm sorry, of I can't hear you. You can't hear me? Because switch. On. Okay. Can you hear me now, Arthur? I can.
But I think that really there was a lot of panic, to be perfectly honest, and and it was hard to control people's emotions uh, and even logic. And even today I have people wearing N95 masks despite us not having a community infection for over 10 days. So um, it, it does depend a little bit on that. But we, when we weren't sure, we just N95 masks, face shields, goggles, and follow all the, the correct instructions. Okay. Any message for Indians because we are now having a surge of cases. Uh, how should we manage our endoscopy suits? Uh, uh, we were locked down for two months, but with the economics uh, coming into the picture, we have to open up. And now we have to balance between uh, the prevention of new cases and also keep our economy going. So we are we have to keep a balance. Any any uh, suggestions for? Indian uh, doctors? Uh, if only you could turn back the clock, but um, I think the reality is that, that just do what you need to do. Um, because when I looked at your curves earlier today, it's still on the increase. So we still don't know where the peak is for India. Uh, we don't know how, how badly your hospital will be affected. And if it's anything like Spain or Italy, an entire hospital can be a COVID hospital. So preserve your equipment. The best way to do that is to only do what you must do um, and uh, and just wait and see. When when you get your downturn and you have some confidence back, then you can start to increasing your capacity. But just hold on for the minute and, and wait and see what's going to happen because you, you don't want to run out of equipment when you really need it. That's really the most important thing. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, thank you, Arthur, uh, for your fantastic talk and uh, there were a lot of humorous slides and uh, hope we, uh, we know Australian as a cricketer and uh, hope hopefully the soon the cricket will start in Australia and uh, India too. Uh, thank you, Dr. There's Rajesh. a lot of distancing yeah. in, uh, in cricket, so it should be safe. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So hopefully the cricket will have with spectators, not without spectators. <laughs> okay. Hope to see you soon, Arthur. Thank, thank you, have Arthur. A good day. Thank, thank you very much, guys. All the best. Good luck yeah, with everything. Thank you. Thank you.